Cool. I'm just gonna pop next door to see how Yeah, that's fine. Okay, hopefully this way. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's start. Thanks everyone for coming. I know it's late on a Monday, so. And thank you to my best for coming, even though you guys have seen most of the slides before, I'm sorry. <laughs> cool, so today we're going to be covering some, I think Yale did lower GIT, uh, sorry, upper GIT with you last week, and so hopefully she would have covered everything um, that I'm not covering today. Um, so we'll go through some uh, conditions of the pancreas, the small intestine, the large intestine, the rectum and the anus, and then we'll do some OSCE presentations and particular sessions that you might get. Cool. So let's start with pancreatitis. I'm going to try to make this interactive, but if you guys are too unresponsive, I'll just give up and make it didactic, so that's fine. Okay, so pancreatitis is the inflammation of the pancreas, basically. It can be acute or it can be chronic. Um, and if it's acute, then that the assumption is that it, can, it will reverse itself afterwards. Um, but if it's chronic, that usually happens after you've had a few episodes of acute pancreatitis, and then there's irreversible structural changes to the pancreas. Okay. Um... Can you guys please name, give me a cause of pancreatitis, starting from Jake at the front. Um, alcohol. Alcohol, good. Uh, stones. Stones, good. What stones? Uh, what stones? Gold stones. Gold stones. Here you go. Stones, Yeah. Short one, that was, people, you can't hear at home. Drugs. Yep. Um, it's not one of the causes that I have, but smoking's bad anyway, so that's fine. All right. Um, so this is the mnemonic that most people use. It's called I Get Smashed, and basically the top three most common causes of pancreatitis are gallstones and alcohol, and then idiopathic, which is a bit of a cop-out answer, but a lot of it is unexplained. And then there's lots of random ones like scorpion stings. It can be autoimmune. Um, and it can be due to like hypercalcemia or hyperlipidemia. And you can get pancreatitis after an ERCP because you get irritation to the area as well. So that's an important one to remember. Um, in terms of clinical features, so a person with pancreatitis will present most likely with epigastric, like very severe epigastric abdominal pain that radiates to the back. Um, and you'll have a fever, they won't want to eat, they'll be nauseous, they might throw up a few times. And if it's quite severe, then they can get jaundice because it can compress in the bile duct as well. Um, and then you might notice signs of retroperitoneal hemorrhage, which is a complication of pancreatitis. And you can get Cullen, sign and Gray Turners, which I've got pictures of over here. Um, in terms of investigations, we like to make our investigations into bedside bloods and imaging, if you haven't been taught that already. So bedside <coughs> investigations you can do include a urinalysis and just a blood sugar. Um, in terms of bloods, you'll do FBE, UEC, LFTs, CRP, you can do coags and calcium. And the really important ones that you have to do for pancreatitis, a lipase and amylase. Does anyone know why? <coughs> yes, Jay. Uh, like, but that's what the pancreas produces, so any inflammation, they go up. Yeah, good. Um, and so... Enzymes. So what are you looking for on your analysis? Clearly you're ruling out... You can rule out an infection or something else, basically. Um, so in terms of imaging, you can do an ultrasound, although you don't usually see much, except for like <clears throat> a little... maybe a little sac around the pancreas. Um, it's... Basically, we'll just do an abdominal CT, because you can, you can search for complications of pancreatitis um, and then ERCPs are really good because you can visualize the pancreatitis and you can treat as well. So if there are gallstones, you can pop them out basically. Um, so in terms of management, most people who have pancreatitis will be quite severely ill. I don't know if you guys have seen them in hospital, but they have really, really severe pain and they can be quite um, unstable. And so you might need to resuscitate them. So give them hydration, like put in some cannulas and hydrate them, give them oxygen. They'll need 
like quite strong analgesia, morphine most likely, and antiemetics as well. Um, they'll have to be kept near by mouth because they can't eat because anything, any food will exacerbate the pain. So they might even need, um, most people with pancreatitis you'll see has an NGT tube in. Um, and then you have to treat the underlying cause, obviously. So if it's gallstones, then you can do an ERCP. If it's happened a few times, you might consider like a, to take out the gallbladder. Um, and if it's an alcohol, like if they had a binge drink over the weekend, just tell them to not do that, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Um, cool. So next, we're going to talk about a small bowel obstruction. Can someone please tell me some causes of an SBO? Let's go up that side. Adhesions, good, that's the most common. Hernia? Stretches? Pardon? Yep. Tumors? Good, all right. So the mnemonic I use is shaving. Um, so stricture, hernia, adhesions, volvulus, interception, those are more sort of pediatric type things, you don't really get them in adults. Um, neoplasm and gallstone ileus. Cool. Um, so in terms of management of small bowel obstruction, a lot of it is just, uh, it can be quite conservative if it's if you think it's going to pass eventually. Um, you can do an abdominal x-ray to confirm that there is a small bowel obstruction. What will you see on abdo x-ray? Yes, good. Um, and so what you'll do is just figure out what caused it, try to correct it if you can, and then if the small bowel obstruction doesn't resolve within 48 to 72 hours, you'll have to send them to surgery and they'll have to lapro put a laparoscope in there and remove the bowel obstruction, basically. Cool. Celiac disease. So I'm going through small bowel issues at the moment. Just um, so celiac disease is an autoimmune condition and it primarily affects the small intestine and it's due to a uh, reactivity to gliadin. Um, so clinical features would be you come in with like abdominal distension and cramping, maybe a bit of diarrhea, um, it could be steatorrhea as well because they're not absorbing properly. Um, in children then they'll, ha they'll fail to thrive. And most people with uh, celiac will have um, some, like an anemia. Does anyone know which anemia? And why is that? Because uh, her iron is absorbed in and that's quite Yes, good. Um, and so you can get also this thing called dermatitis hepatiformis, which is an extra intestinal manifestation of celiac. And it's just this little picture here, and it's not very nice. Cool. So some investigations you can do. The gold standard for celiac is a gastroscope, and you take a biopsy of the small intestine. Isn't that after you have to fast and cook for a while, and then they have a like, challenge or something? Or um, is something to do with that you can do that as well, but for gold, you can just take a bit of it, and you'll see blunting of the villi. You'll get like atrophy of the villus and the so thing. Um. You can, like this is, you, you'll probably, if you suspect someone has celiac, you'll do other things before you go straight, because you don't want to just give everyone a gastroscope. Um, so, but that's the gold standard. You can look for antibodies as well, and you can give them like a gluten-free diet and see how they respond kind of thing. Um, and basically the only way to manage celiac disease is to maintain a gluten-free diet. Cool. Hernias. Um, so a hernia is a protrusion of a viscous or a part of viscous through a defect in the wall. Um, and so you just get a lump of a particular organ that's not supposed to be there. Um, it's quite common. So males, 20 to 25% of males get a hernia and 2% of females can get a hernia. Um, your, indirect, your inguinal hernias are the most common and then the next most common are femoral and indirect is more common than direct. So we'll go through what the different hernias are a bit later. Um, risk factors, past medical history, family history, just your usual things. Um, the ones to be aware of are obesity um, and anything that causes an increase in intra-abdominal pressure basically. So pregnancy, if you cough a lot and if you smoke. Okay, so hernias can be complete, incomplete, incarcerated or strangulated. Um, and incomplete and complete just refers to how much of the organ has protruded out basically. Um, incarcerated means that the organ is trapped in that place and you can't, it's irreducible basically, you can't push it back in. And if it's strangulated, then that's a really bad thing because you've had a compromise of the vascular supply and that's a surgical emergency and you have to yeah, send them to surgery to get that removed basically. Um, here's just a picture of different types of hernias that you can get and where they are. The ones that you probably 
and need to know will be the inguinal and the femoral. And I guess umbilical sometimes comes up, but the other two aren't that common. So femoral hernias are located inferior and lateral to the pubic tubercle. And they're most likely to be strangulated given the tight space that they go through. Um, they're more common in females. So this is like a Monash buzzwordy exam question type thing. Um, femoral hernias are more common in females, but inguinal hernias are more common in general. So you'll still get, like if a female presents with a hernia, it's still most likely to going to be an inguinal hernia. But if it was a femoral hernia, then it was more likely to occur in a female than a male. I hope that makes sense. But basically, if there's a Monash question that comes up and a female has a hernia, it's going to be femoral. Cool. Um, inguinal hernias can be indirect or direct. If they're indirect, then they pass through the deep inguinal ring. This is just, you guys need to revise your anatomy surrounding the inguinal canal and the structures that come up from there. Um, so it happens in young boys who have a patent processus vaginalis, so it's mostly congenital, and there's a higher risk of strangulation, and these hernias pop out medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. And then the direct passes through the posterior wall of the inguinal canal through this patch called the Hesselbach's triangle, and it's like a weakness in the posterior wall. Um, it reduces quite easily, and these ones pop out lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. So you have to be able to differentiate between them. Um, here's a photo. Oh, it got cut off. But anyway, here's a, a diagram of where they go. Okay, so moving on to large bowel now, we'll talk about IBD. So IBD comes up quite a lot, I think. It's quite important. It's an autoimmune um, condition. It made up, it's made up of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And these conditions can, they can overlap. Like someone can have sort of a mix of UC and Crohn's, um, but you figure out what they have based on sort of what the histology is. So before we go into that, you should know the different layers of the GIT tract. Um, and so I've got that up there. <clears throat> um, Crohn's is pretty much the inflammatory disorder that affects um, the entire gut from the mouth to your anus. Um, and it affects all the layers of the gut. So it's transmural. So it affects all four layers of the gut. Um, it happens mostly, it's diagnosed when you're quite young because it's autoimmune. So before 30 years old, more common in Caucasians, there's a genetic component, as I said. Um, it occurs most commonly at the terminal ileum and the ascending colon, but it can be anywhere. Um, you get lots of ulcers um, that lead to a cobblestone appearance. That's the buzzword, cobblestone. And you can get non caseating granulomas that can form, and you get strictures and fistulas, and that can lead to a bowel obstruction. So, one of the main complications of Crohn's is you get a stricture and then you're, you obstruct basically and then that can perforate if you don't treat it quickly. Um, so something to notice in Crohn's is it is quite patchy in terms of where it affects. So these are called skip lesions. So in this picture you can have like the cobblestone appearance there and then it's completely fine like right next to it. So this is different to um, ulcerative colitis. So UC affects um, the colon, so anywhere from rectum to cecum, and it goes, it, it will start at the disease will start at the rectum and it will go up to the cecum basically. Um, again, quite a young um, onset. Um, the risk is less in smokers, but like, don't go telling people to smoke. <laughs> um, it's just fun fact. It's not cool. <laughs> um, and then, so you get rectal and left colonic disease more commonly than you get. Um, pancolitis, which is good because you don't want the whole bowel being affected. Um, and so it will involve the entire colon. You don't get skip lesions, so you'll get like an entire patch basically. Um, it's only confined to the mucosa, which is the innermost layer that we talked about. Um, you can get pseudopolyps, um, and that's part of the reason why ulcerative colitis can give you an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Um, the biggest complication to look out for in terms of UC is this thing that we call toxic megacolon, which is when you get a really, really acute dilatation of large bowel and then it can perforate, which is not good. So they both kind of present in a similar way, but there are some tiny little differences and you should be able to differentiate between what Crohn's looks like and what UC looks like. Um, you can read off the slide, but the main things that I want to point out would be um, UC normally presents with a bloodier diarrhea, 
you can get it in Crohn's as well, but it's more common in UC. Um, Another thing would be, in terms of the complications for Crohn's, so you can get perianal fissures and fistulas because it extends from the mouth to the anus. Um, you can also get uh, ulcers in your mouth, which you don't get in UC. Um, and, yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of differences in clinical features. There is this thing that's called extra-intestinal manifestations of IBD, and you should know what they are because consultants love to quiz you about them on rounds, I've um, found. Um, so erythema nodosum, pyoderm, like you've got skin things, you've got joint things, and then you've got eye things, basically. So your skin things, erythema nodosum, and pyoderm are gangrenosum. Um, and then you get peripheral arthritis, it's quite common. And then in terms of eyes, you can get like a, basically just inflammation. So uveitis, iritis, and episcleritis as well. Um, the buzzword for UC is primary sclerosing cholangitis in terms of an extra intestinal manifestation. So let's keep note of that. Uh, in terms of investigations, you'll do your basic or your bloods um, and then you'll do a CRP and ESR as well because that is an indication of inflammation. Um, you can do a stool culture if someone's coming in with diarrhea just to rule out sort of an infectious cause if you're not sure it could be gastro kind of thing. Um, in Crohn's, you can get like sort of serology markers like PANCA and ASCA. You don't really have to know what they are, but just keep that in mind. Um, in terms of uh, imaging, you can do an abdominal x-ray. So most people don't do abdominal x-rays to diagnose. It's more you once you once you know someone has Crohn's or once you know someone has come in with like an acute flare-up of their UC, you will do daily abdo x-rays to monitor the progression of their disease. Because in Crohn's, you do an abdo x-ray to see, to check for like <laughs> stricturing and to see if they've bowel obstructed basically. And then in UC, you can see if they've developed toxic megacolon. So you'll see that in hospital, people who have come in with a flare-up of IVD will have daily abdo x-rays. And then obviously once you're, like once the flare-up has kind of ceased, you can do a, a colonoscope and take a biopsy as well, which is the gold standard for diagnosis. But you don't perform a colonoscopy during an active flare-up of IVD because there's a chance that you'll perforate the bowel. So this is called string sign on x-ray. Um, and basically it's a stricture, it's a stricture that's happened in Crohn's. And that's kind of a buzzword. And then this is an abdo x-ray of toxic megacolon. Just wanted to show you guys that as well. So that's really bad and that'll probably perforate if you don't treat it. Okay, so in terms of management, there 